We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, Arundel Christian Church. Open up to Colossians chapter 3 today. Uh, we're going to talk about what it looks like to have a godly home. What does it look like to have a godly home? Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my family. I would say the greatest gift I have ever received, other than the gift of salvation and a relationship with Jesus Christ, that's certainly the best gift I've ever received. But my, my second favorite gift of all time is the gift of my family. My, my wife is sitting here in the third row. Can, can you guys imagine? You probably, some of you don't even like showing up here for one service every week. Uh, my wife oftentimes sits here three times and listens to me teach. And she just, she's such a lovely, lovely bride. But she, <laughs> my best friend, we've been married 22 years. Uh, yeah, we're super excited about that. And God has given us three daughters. We have one in college one in high school, and one in middle school. And I, so I'm a dad of three dirt girls. I don't have any boys uh, yet, though I'm sure they'll marry into... Uh, well, I'll have some... <laughs> We're not planning on any naturally, but maybe God will bless us uh, through marriage with some sons. But uh, we have also a house uh, that God has blessed us with. Now, now when I say a house... I, 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 first of all, I don't want to mis, mislead you. Uh, the, the bank really owns the house at this point, if, if you do the math. But uh, it, more than just a house, you think of a house, you think of like a structure, right? Uh, but what I, what I love more than and the house is that God has blessed us with a home. A home is something more than just uh, the, the wood and the, the siding and the windows and the doors and all that stuff. A home is something that uh, you can have without all that, right? A home is where you... you uh, in fact, if you guys know um, the, the author of The Little House on the Prairies, Laura Ingram Wilders, right? She, or sorry, I didn't say that right. Laura Ingalls Wilder, one of my favorite quotes of hers is this, home is the nicest word there is. Some of you might not have that experience. Some of you grew up in a house, but you didn't grow up in a home. You wish you'd grown up in a home. You wish you had a place that you're like, man, this place is home. But maybe you're all over the place or you had parents that weren't really that, that encouraging to you or maybe you didn't have that at all. And so you don't really understand what, what I mean when I say home. But home is, is one of the nicest words. And when, you, when I got here this morning, I was overwhelmed with all sorts of things. I had people on staff coming at me from every angle saying, don't forget to announce this. Don't forget to say this. We need a thousand of these things and we need all this stuff. And I'm like... My goodness, I'm talking to my wife, and I'm like, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know if I can preach this morning. And she just whispers a prayer into my ear. Like, that's what I mean by home. Like a place of comfort and peace, of, of a place where you know, like, you're, you're secure and you're protected and you're with your people. And Paul goes out of his way in his letter to the church in Colossae to say, here's how you can build a healthy home. And my favorite thing about my, my family, yeah, not my favorite thing, one of the things I'm really proud of is all three of my girls love Jesus. Now, they don't just like say it. Like it's not just this thing and we drag them to church. They, they sincerely and with all of their heart are followers of Jesus. And my wife and I, we love Jesus. And so there's, there's a, clearly this understanding that Christ has to be the center of a home. Not a house. But if you're trying to make a godly home, Christ is going to be the center. And here's what Paul says. I'm going to cover only four verses. I was supposed to preach all the way through chapter 4, verse 1 today, but I decided not to do that. Let's going to get through verse 21. It said, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Children, Always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. And fathers, do not aggravate your children, or they will become discouraged. 
So in this passage, you're going to see four clear delineations, four different roles and what they're supposed to do in their role. And so we're going to cover that together this morning. The first one is this, wives should submit to their husbands. Now, I'm surprised I didn't just hear like an audible, (gasps) because this is one of the most difficult things to stand up on on a stage in a church and say, like, this is what the Bible says. Wives should submit to their husbands. I went on to AI this week, and I, I told an artificial intelligence uh, photo maker to create a, a comic of a pastor who's about to preach that wives should submit to their husbands. And this is what it spit out. <laughs> this is a little bit what it feels like as a pastor to get up in, in a world, the world that we live in right now, where There's a lot of division when it comes to the roles of different genders and a lot of conversation about gender and all this stuff. And yet, at the end of the day, what I want to do, I just want to be a church that says, I don't really care what the conversation is on this news channel or that that journalist or that politician. I don't don't want to care any about any of that. What I want to do is just open up God's Word. And what does God's Word say is a key to building a godly home? And when we open it up, regardless of how we feel about it, it's really clear. It says, wives should submit to their husbands. Now let's talk about what that means and what it doesn't mean. I don't want anyone walking away thinking like, uh, maybe misunderstanding this. Now, historically, the context of this day and age, women were kind of like, like almost possessions of their husbands. The roles were were very different. Their their level of what women can and couldn't do in this day and age was very different. You know, husbands could divorce their wives really for any reason at any time uh, in in that culture, and wives, they they couldn't do that. They were basically owned by their husbands. And so uh, keep that in context as we're reading this. But we want to look at that word submit. What does it mean when Scripture uses the word submit? If we go to the Greek... It's a Greek word, hupotasso. It says, wives, you're supposed to hupotasso your husbands. And hupotasso simply means to arrange in order underneath something else voluntarily. It doesn't mean that uh, you're you're being forced to, to give up certain rights. You have all the same rights, but you understand that in order for a family to function in a healthy, proper way, that you're, you're intentionally and voluntarily placing yourself under the authority of a husband who's going to lead the home. That's what it says. Husbands ought to place, or wives ought to place themselves under the authority of their husbands. Now, I think one of the ways to help this make sense would be like a, a football team. When you send out your your offense to the line of scrimmage, right? You, you, you typically have one quarterback. You have one person who, for the sake of the, the play, for the sake of the team, everyone's agreed we're going to place ourselves under the authority of the quarterback who's going to call the shots. Now, there might be a coach calling the shots, just like Jesus Christ calls the shots in our lives through the Word. We can look to the sidelines and know what plays we ought to run, but at the end of the day, when you're looking at what's going on, you're seeing how the defense is lined up, someone's got to be there to call, call the play. Here's, here's we're going to move some things around. We're going to do this in order to accomplish the goal that we've been given by the coach, which is to score touchdowns. And sometimes you got you know, other quarterbacks, but they're not in the play. And if they are in the play, there's probably a trick play going on of some sort, but there's one person who's calling the shots. And in a family unit, for the family to function the way God's designed it, there's going to be a head. There's going to be, you know, anything with two heads, what do we call that? A monster. Right, so in order for a family to function the way God's designed it, there's going to be a, a head. Now, let's look at this in, in, in another passage of Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 11, we see something really interesting. We learn that this is not about superiority, but it's about functionality. Let me show you this. It says, but there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. Now, if you look at that very last part of that, the head of Christ is God. If you were to take that and interpret it, 
that Jesus is inferior to God the Father, that would be heresy. That somehow Jesus is, is uh, less than or has less rights or less power or is not as all-knowing and omniscient and all those things, that, that would be heretical to say. So when it says here that Christ, the head of Christ is God, what it simply means is that he's willingly, hupotasso, right? He's decided to voluntarily submit under the authority while he's a, a human living on this earth to voluntarily fall under the authority of God to submit to the will of God the Father. And that's simply what's going on. See, Jesus voluntarily placed his rights aside in order to fulfill a greater purpose, in order to be able to come and live the human experience, to to do it in a perfect way so he could die on the cross in your place and for the forgiveness of your sins. So that you could step into salvation, Jesus willingly submitted to God the Father in order to accomplish a greater purpose. Does it mean Jesus is less than? No. Wives, does it mean that you're less than? No. You're loved equally. You're you're part of God's plan. Just like your husband, he has a purpose and plan for your life. But there's a, a model for the family that God lays out in Scripture, and it's that wives should submit to their husbands as the head, the leader of the home. Now, let me give you a few warnings on this. God's word should always trump the word of your husband. If your husband says, hey, you know what? I command you. No, we're not doing church no more. You can't go to that place. Just ignore him because God wants you here. If God tells you to do something your husband tells you not to do, listen to God's word. If your husband says, hey, we're going out tonight. We're getting plastered. Say, you know what? I don't submit to you more than I submit to God. I'm not doing that. And so we always want to submit to God the Father first, but there's an understanding of letting your husband lead. It's going to provide a healthier home. I understand that not every family works this way. It's kind of like a, if you look at the four things we're going to talk about today, kind of like a four-legged stool. A stool with three legs will still work. You might be in a situation where you're like, I don't have a husband who leads. I don't have a husband who loves Jesus. Or my husband left. You know, I'm a single mom and I'm doing this thing on my own. And listen, I, you know, that's, that's tough because in a real a perfect situation, that wouldn't be the case. But unfortunately, the truth and reality is for a lot of us, we, we got we to work with a three-legged stool. I got good news for you. You know, we, we also get to do this thing with the help of Christ who can help to make sure you can still have a godly home even if one of the legs is missing, okay? Wives, I want to encourage you, maybe... A next step you need to take today is to let your husband lead. Maybe there's areas of your life where you're making all the decisions and you could say, hey, what? I want to teach and help and encourage my husband to lead our family. And so you willingly say, you know what? Hey, why don't you lead us in this? Here's the second one. Number two is husbands should love their wives. Husbands should love their wives. It says in Colossians 3, 19, Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. I want you to understand historically, too, this would have been a radical request. The idea of asking a husband to to treat his wife in in an agape, unconditional love sort of way, this would have been something that would have been culturally like really odd. And yet it's the command that we have, guys, as husbands, to love our wives in this way. And it's not just to love your wife. Ephesians, Paul writes to the, a letter to the church in Ephesus, and he adds a little bit more understanding to this. He says in Ephesians 5, verse 25, he says, For husbands, this means love your wives. You ready for this? Just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. This is the kind of love that we're supposed to have for our wives. Agape love. Agape love is a, a Greek, uh, one of the Greek versions of love. It means unconditionally. It means it doesn't matter how nice your wife is being. It doesn't ma- matter if she's getting on your nerves or not. It doesn't matter what the scale says when she stands on it. It doesn't matter what she looks like when she wakes up in the morning. None of that matters. When you love your wife unconditionally, you're choosing to love your wife the way Christ loves his church. 
I don't know about you, but I'm a messed up, broken person. I am so thankful that even in my sin, Jesus doesn't give up on me. I made vows, right? When you think about it, when we commit our life to following Jesus, we're saying, God, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to call the shots. I want to do things your way. And then we, within like 30 minutes, we end up doing something our own way again. It's like we immediately cheat on the the bridegroom. And I'm so thankful that the way Jesus loves the church is he doesn't quit on us. He doesn't give up on us. He continues to love us unconditionally. This is the model that we guys, we have for our wives. Now, you think about how the first command for wives to submit to their husbands and for husbands to love their wives, how those fit so beautifully together. It's important to understand that while a husband has the authority, this authority must be mixed with a healthy affection for his bride. Think about this, ladies. Would you mind being led by a man who knows your your needs and your desires and is going out of his way to meet them and to love you the way Christ loves you? It becomes so much easier to submit to the authority of someone who, who loves you that way, who's willing. I mean, how did Jesus love the church? So much that he was willing to sacrifice his life on the cross for us. Guys, are you willing to to provide for and protect and sacrifice and even possibly lay down your life for your bride? If you love her that way, you're going to build a healthy home and you're going to see a wife who longs to and willingly wants to submit to your leadership because of the way you provide and protect and meet her needs lovingly the way Christ does for his church. I wrote down a few thoughts here. A, A man who is a leader and not a lover. That's what we call a tyrant. And a man who is a lover, but not a leader, I call that man a sap. Or maybe in modern vernacular, a simp. If you think about the meaning of the word husband, A lot of people don't understand that. If you look at the entomology of the word husband, it actually is a farming word. It it comes from the word to cultivate. Husbands, we are called to to like a, a farmer loves the land in order to see it produce great things. A farmer lovingly cultivates the land and and tills the soil and plants seeds, and waters it, and nourishes it, and makes sure that the weeds are out of the the, the field so that there can be an incredible, bountiful harvest. Husbands, that is what we are called to do for our wives, to cultivate lovingly the way Christ does for his church. My dad taught me this thing before he passed away. Um, Before I got married, he said, Matt, I want you to know there are three kinds of back scratches. The first kind of back scratch sounds like this. Hey, will you scratch my back? It feels so good. That's the first kind. The second one is, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. A little quid pro quo kind of back scratch. And the third one is, hey, would you let me scratch your back? I know how good it feels. Husbands, we are called into that third kind of back scratch. We're called to lovingly and sacrificially love our wives the way Christ loves the church, to, to provide for, protect, and give, and, and, and show affection to our wives. Uh, that's the kind of love that Jesus has for his, his bride, the church. And so that's what we're called to do. Number three, ready? Children should obey their parents. Children should obey their parents. Here's how Paul puts it in the letter, verse 20. He says, children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. By the way, children in the room, it pleases mom and dad too. It pleases the Lord, but it also pleases your mom and dad. And it goes on, it says, uh, this, this, always obey your parents. This isn't something you do occasionally. You know, when I was growing up, my dad always said, delayed Obedience is disobedience. In other words, don't just obey them 
after you, just, you feel like doing it, like when your parents say something, you step in into obedience. Always obey your parents. Now, let's explore the Greek in this. This word children is a Greek word. It comes from techna, which is essentially the meaning of that is anyone who's still under the care and provision of, uh, of the authority of the home, you fall under this umbrella of children. I don't care if you're 35 years old and you're still living in mom and dad's basement, then you are under the authority of your parents. You're still under their provision. They're paying your, your insurance. They're paying your cell phone bill and paying all your stuff and you're living with them. You are a child who's under their authority and you need to obey them. Now, at some point, you grow up, maybe, and you, you, you become one. You leave your mom and dad, and you, you cleave to another, and you now are uh, no longer a child. Or maybe you, God hasn't called you to marriage. He's called you to singleness, but you step out, and on your own, you become your own person, and you take care of your responsibilities. At that point, you're no longer a child. But those of you who are not in that category, you are still children, and Scripture says to obey your mom and dad. Now, the word obey comes from the word hupakuo, which simply means to listen under. You know, when your parents say, are you even listening to me? Listen to what I'm saying. What they're really saying is, I need you to obey me, to listen under what I'm asking you to do. Now, here, let me give you three reasons why children, if you're a child in this room, I want to give you three reasons why you should obey your parents. The first one is simple. You are expensive. (laughs) On average, from the age of zero to 18, let's just say you move out at 18, the the average cost of raising a child in in the Western world is about $310,000. And so here's, I think, a great great rule. If you don't want to obey me, fine, pay it back. Like, I'm out 310 grand to try to raise you up in godliness. And if you don't want to do what I'm saying, then you got to move out and give me that money back. You're on your own. Here's the other thing, another thing why children, it's simply in this verse, children obey your parents. Why? Because it pleases the Lord. It's one of the things you can do to please the Lord. Another simple logical reason is if you can't learn obedience within the authority structure of a godly home, you are not going to learn authority outside of the home. You're going to go out into this world as a rebel who doesn't understand the authority that's been placed over you in the workplace, the authority that's been placed over you in, in, uh, you know, with the police department, the authority that's been placed over you in any situation. You're going to constantly uh, push back against authority because you never learned it as a child in the home. Now, by the way, the same rule applies, kids. If your parents tell you to break the laws of God, disobey them. God always comes first. All right. Number four, parents should encourage their children. Parents should encourage their children. Now, this one, I decided to word it in the notes a little differently than Paul writes it. Paul writes it in the opposite format. He says in verse 31, fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. In other words, it's not good to discourage them. So what should we do, parents? We ought to encourage, not discourage them. Again, in this passage of Scripture, we see the male headship. It's specifically calling out fathers who are the primary disciplers and and discipliners within the home. But I think these rules apply to both sets of parents. Now, when it says to encourage them, I want to give you a caveat here. I want to ask you to always be encouraging your children towards God's vision for their life, not your vision for their life. I bet some of you have an incredible vision for their life. You know, it sounds something like this. I can't wait for them. I got it all planned out. They're going to buy a house right next door. They're going to have a spouse of this beautiful home that's bigger and better than ours. And then they're going to have a bunch of grandbabies. And the grandbabies and I, they're going to come and go. And you got this whole plan laid out for their life. But maybe, just maybe, that plan isn't God's plan for their life. And so it's our job to figure out how we encourage them to pursue the plan and purpose that God has put on their life. 
and to separate it from the ideal situation that we have in our head for what we would like them to do with their life. We want to encourage them towards God's vision for their life. I wrote down a a quick list of of ways that we can aggravate our kids. If you do these things, these these things are going to aggravate. These things are going to discourage your children. The first thing is, is domineering them. Another way of looking at this would be like helicopter parenting. If you are unwilling to let your kids uh, grow in their strength and ability to, to, to eventually fly outside of the nest, if you do everything for them so that one day when they're expected to go out into this world and be independent, they have never learned how to be independent, they've never learned how to make wise decisions because you've done everything for them, this kind of domineering behavior is not encouraging them. We want to train them up. Another thing would be overloading. Number two would be overloading. Maybe you have expectations for them that are just far too high. I think there's value in pushing them farther than they think they can go because you know they have more in them than they're willing to show. And so you're pushing them a little bit. But sometimes we set these expectations for them that are just so out of nowhere that they're destined for constantly letting you down and failing you. Don't overload them. Another way, a third way we aggravate our children is with hypocrisy. If you think the phrase, do as I say, not as I do, works, it doesn't. Parents, we need to model in the home what we're asking our children to to model in their lives. We want to show them what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. We want to show them what it looks like to be a, a worshiper who gathers in the church every week. We want to show them what it looks like to sacrifice and serve others. We want to show them what it looks like to share the gospel. We want to show them what it looks like to open up God's word. We want to show them these things. And when we say one thing and do something else, they have an incredible antenna for this kind of stuff. They know right away that you're a hypocrite if you don't. Another fourth thing I wrote down for aggravating your kids is criticism. I think uh, there's an appropriate amount of criticism. It's okay to criticize when our kids make a mistake to point that out. But ask yourself, do you criticize more or do you compliment more in your home? Some sociologists or psychologists or whatever you want to call them will say that you should have about four compliments for every criticism if you want them to thrive Another thing I wrote down is favoritism. How many of you have a favorite child? Just kidding. You know. <laughs> How about this? How many of you are your parents' favorite child? Yeah. Here's the deal. You're not supposed to know that. You're not supposed to know it. Uh, parents will not, you will rarely admit that they have a favorite child, right? But oftentimes we don't even realize it, that we, we expect out of one child, uh, you know, we... we hold one child to the standards and compare them to another child. Like, well, your sister, when she was this age, and we do that, your kids are all very unique. God made them different. They are not the same. And so we want to be careful not to show favoritism and compare them to each other. Another thing I wrote down, this is probably the most important one. If you want to aggravate your kids, be inconsistent in the home. Have a set of rules that sometimes you follow. And have everyone constantly guessing whether or not this is the time the rule applies or not. Say, hey, you know what? You're not allowed to have your cell phone out until your homework's done, and then don't enforce that rule ever. Say, hey, you're not allowed to do this, or we expect every time you do this, we go out for ice cream, and then just be inconsistent, and it'll aggravate your kids. Set some rules, set some boundaries, and then stick to them. Inconsistency. I wrote down... Consistency equals stability. Another thing that can aggravate our children is overcommitment. If your life is constantly moving from place to place, from place to place, your, your calendars and schedule of events, that all the things are moving around, you're putting thousands of miles on your car every day, just moving everyone to all the things they got going on to the place where you don't even have time to, to date your spouse, you don't have time to set some examples in the home, you don't have time to sit around a table and have a meal together, you don't have time for any of this stuff because you've just overloaded everybody's schedules. That will aggravate your children. I know when I stepped into this role as a lead pastor, one of the things I told my kids, because I 
I wanted to make sure they didn't become like stereotypical pastor's kids. I wanted them to continue to love Jesus. And so I said, listen, if I'm ever in a conversation with someone and you want to talk to me, just come up and squeeze my hand three times. And it'll remind me that you are more important to me than the person I'm talking with in that moment. I will pause this conversation and give you my full attention. What are some boundaries that you set up to your kids know that you are not so overloaded that they can't have your attention? The last thing I wrote down is minimizing. Sometimes what we do is our, when our kids act foolish, we act like it's not a big deal because we don't want to have to process through what it looks like to discipline and disciple our kids. Don't minimize the things that they do that need to be dealt with. These things will aggravate You see, our primary role as fathers and mothers is to disciple our children. And the younger you start, every study will show you this, the younger you start, the better. All right, so flip over your paper for me. On the back side, you have what now, God. And I want to encourage us every Sunday not just to think about our what now, God, but to actually... Uh, write something down that we're going to do. What's one practical step you're going to take this week? You're going to carry on for the days to come to be a better husband, to be a better wife, to be a better uh, child within the home, to be a better parent. What is it that God's calling you to do? I want you to write that down so that when you walk out of here today, you're more like Jesus than when you came in. You're able to build a home that's built on God's truth. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for the truth of your word. We ask that you'd give us the courage to to thrive within the truth of your word more than we want to live within our truth. There's all sorts of things that we think are right and good, but when they don't line up with the truth of your word, would you help us to move some things around, to make some shifts, because we recognize that you are good and your plan is good and your plan is best. Help us to consistently apply the truth of what we were talking about today of of wives submitting to their husbands and husbands loving their wives the way you Jesus love your church that our children would learn to obey their parents and that as parents we would do an incredible job encouraging our children into godliness into the plan and vision you have for their lives we love you and we thank you we pray this in Jesus name amen Wow, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.